very much um, for coming today. Um, I know I know a number of the faces here. Um, I'm I'm Roger Jackman, president of the Syrian. Um, very glad that you're here today. We've got some uh, we've got some smart people in the room that are going to um, deliver on some very good topics. Tom smiles a little bit, but he is one of the smart people. Tom Shirley, um, he will be discussing our session initiation protocol session. Uh, we've got Andy Deason here. Um, he is going to be talking about virtualization. And then Kevin Mayo, who I think so many of you know, um, as well as Brett Larkins, uh, who is relatively new to us out of our Billings, uh, Montana office, um, they're going to wrap up the session with wireless. Uh, this is the third stop on the Day of Learning tour, so these guys should have, this, uh, have these uh, subject matters down cold by this time. Uh, we, we started about a week ago here in our Seattle offices, then they went down to uh, Portland and wrapped up here in, in, in Spokane. Um, again, really appreciate the fact that you're all here. A um, little bit of logistics, I think most of you guys have found where the bathrooms are. Men and women. Uh, the women are definitely outnumbered here. A couple of the other um, introductions. Don Waldy over here um, on the side. Don's um, relatively new, but took a little 10-year hiatus from Syrian Networks and then uh, chose to come back, see the, see the greener grass, all that good stuff. It's great to have Don back. He's a, he's a senior account manager for us. Um, Steve Fisher, I know many of you know Steve's been with us a very long time. Steve oh. Fisher, Vice President of Sales. Let's see, Heather Ross, maybe you haven't uh, gotten to know Heather. Um, she's out of our Portland office and she is the Director of our Learning Center. So she is the one who's responsible for uh, bringing, this, uh, bringing us here today. Um, Jamie Harris, partner of mine, partner in crime. All those good things keep, keeps me on the straight and narrow, but um, probably does the same thing for you guys if you, if you know Jamie. Um, partner as well as senior account manager here at uh, Sirium. Let's see who else is up. Chad, Chad O'Donnell's there in the um, doorway. Chad's a senior account manager as well. Who am I missing? Cameraman. Trying to hide back. Anyways, um, it'll be a good session today. Uh, these are very key topics associated with unified communication, and, and quite frankly, all you know, and all the things that we're doing from a um, uh, information technology perspective. And the guys um, here delivering the topics are very well read, and um, certainly are subject matter experts uh, in the three in the three areas that we're going to be discussing today. Here's the one thing I would encourage you. And so, you know, coming upon topics and so forth is always very difficult. What, what do people want to hear about? And you know, trying to light upon something that, that gets everybody's attention is, is, is a challenge at time. You know, at the end of the session, of course, you're not gonna get out of here without having to do a survey, right? Um, so give us some of your feedback on things that you wanna hear about. And whether we do it in a session or we come out and see you one-on-one, -on -one, you know, give us that input. And we certainly will provide the information where, where applicable and so forth to you. And um, uh, do, do our level best at meeting your needs, okay? Again, thank you. We do appreciate your commitment and time here today, and enjoy the enjoy the next few hours. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good morning. I'm uh, Andy Geeson. I'm systems engineer here at, at Serum Networks. I've been here about seven years. Um, wear many hats, but one of them that I do wear is uh, virtualization and data center. Uh, a couple of questions before we start off talking about virtualization. Uh, how many of your organizations are virtualizing today? Okay. How many of you started virtualizing this year? Okay. Uh, how many of you are the administrators of your virtual environments? Just a couple of you. Okay. Um, how many of you are voice people? Okay. You wear many hats. Um, okay. Well, we'll talk about you know, unified communications a little bit later for voice people. Um, so let's get started. Uh, just an overview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what the benefits and challenges of virtualization are. Um, what is virtualization? Um, just a quick overview of that. Um, components and architecture and uh, resource considerations, you know, your CPU, memory, disk, network. Uh, we're going to talk about unified communications. When I say unified communications, I mean voice and video applications, real-time media. Uh, differences between the two major players in the environment, uh, Microsoft and VMware. And then some management applications that help you manage those environments, 
and then uh, talk about some additional resources. What is virtualization? Virtualization is a, an abstraction of software from the underlying hardware. What does that mean? It means taking software, which is typically your operating system, and putting a middleman between it and the hardware underneath. Typically the operating system directly accesses hardware. And for us to be able to consolidate multiple pieces of software onto the same hardware and not have them be stepping on each other's toes, you need a middleman to handle that and schedule them to the underlying hardware. Some examples of virtualization are uh, application virtualization, which you might, uh, you know, remote desktop or uh, application streaming down to the desktop. Server virtualization, which is what we're focusing on today. Uh, there's network virtualization, things like VLANs, as well as some of the uh, software defined networking. Is, uh, examples of network virtualization. Storage virtualization, uh, things like virtual SANs, where you take multiple disparate uh, storage solutions and kind of uh, pool them together, make them appear as one. Some of the benefits consolidation, being able to take uh, your large server footprint and consolidate it down onto less hardware, which then translates into less infrastructure, such as switch ports, power, cooling, um, as well as uh, personnel time to handle those, that, that infrastructure and the hardware, and maintenance costs, you know, because we're, you're reducing your hardware. Um, some IT agility is gained by being able to manage a lot of your servers from a single pane of glass environment. <laughs> Um, you get a you know achieve server mobility by by abstracting the operating system from the hardware. You can take it and move it from one piece of hardware to another. And actually, using some of the virtualization features, you can do it without interrupting service. So instead of waiting for that 3 a.m. Saturday morning maintenance window to do hardware maintenance, you can actually evacuate a host during the day perform all your maintenance without anybody noticing. Um, there's also the ability to support legacy applications. So if you've got that old server, desktop, whatever, sitting in the back room, and it's supporting some uh, homegrown application that you have to keep, but you know it just sits back there and keeps on trucking, but you're worried about the day that it doesn't. Uh, take that, virtualize it, put it on Hardware that is supported, you you know can keep moving forward, but you don't have to worry about that uh, failing on you. Kind of kind of feeds into the improved availability and reliability. A lot of the uh, features within virtual environments uh, allow for automatic uh, recovery from host failures. Um, there's ability to uh, do replication between data centers, um, failover, and uh, even uh, live migrations, you know, talk about moving from one host to another within a data center. Depending on your infrastructure, you could even do that between data centers. Some of the challenges, server management again. Sometimes it's so easy to just pop out virtual machines. You know, it could take, goes from anywhere from, you know, six weeks or so, like with a physical server, down to maybe five minutes with a virtual server, because it's just so easy. And so you get what's called virt uh, VM sprawl, where you just have VMs out there. Someone says, hey, I need a VM really quick, pop it out. They need it for a couple weeks, and then they don't tell you when they're done. So now it's just sitting out there using resources. And you just have it sitting out there. That's called sprawl. There's other challenges, such as uh, backup considerations and security. Uh, you have to approach your backups a little bit differently um, in a virtual environment to uh, not impact performance and uh, maybe get the most that you can out of the vir virtual uh, features. Uh, security, you know, now that's all kind of in one, all your eggs <coughs> in one basket, and there's potential of, uh, you know, uh, someone maliciously attacking a single host and then affecting multiple applications versus just one. Resource contention, you're now having multiple applications on one piece of hardware rather than more of a one-to-one -one relationship. So now you have to plan your environment correctly, otherwise you'll end up with a uh, whole bunch of applications vying for the same resources. Uh, vendor support used to be a bigger concern. 
you know, having applications support virtualization. Nowadays, pretty much everybody does. Um, you know, a few exceptions, you know, like hardware requirements. Uh, also, uh, IT support. You know, your IT teams need to be able to support the environment because it's not just, you know, one physical server. There's more to it now. Um, so they need to understand the knowledge of it, but also, you know, understand, um, you know, things such as uh, backup and security um, and uh, so how the resources work in the environment so you design it properly. So we'll talk about some of that later. Um, the components, you have the application and the guest operating system. These are what you have today on a physical server. You know, your applications are anything from you know, Exchange or SQL or IS or Apache. Um, your operating system is Windows or Linux. You know, it's what you have today. That's what we're trying to then virtualize. Well, we do that by putting that information into what's called a virtual machine. A virtual machine at its basic level is just a set of files. That's all it is. It's a like config, uh, configuration file that says, here's what, you know, how many processors I have, here's how much RAM I have, here's how many hard drives. And then there's, you know, a uh, hard disk file that sort of actually all the data in it as well as some log files and swap files and things like that. But, you know, at a basic level, it's just a bunch of files that you can throw on a thumb drive, put it in your pocket, and fly across the country, install in a different data center if you want. It's kind of cool. The hypervisor is what actually brings the virtual machine to life. And that is the middleman between the virtual machine and the host, the physical hardware. So the hypervisor, you can think of it, think of a guest operating system as a supervisor. It's got a whole bunch of processes running in it that all need resources, they all need compute, uh, memory, disk, etc. And so the, uh, the operating system has to manage all those requests for resources and then put them towards hardware. Well, in a virtual environment, they're putting them towards the hypervisor. The hypervisor has multiple supervisors or operating systems all sending requests to it. So it's just the supervisor of supervisors and actually doing all the scheduling. So then your host is your physical server, contains all your compute resources, your memory, your storage, connectivity, network connectivity. And then uh, cluster is not, it's more of a logical consideration. It's a configuration, taking multiple hosts and putting them together. So when you take a, when you have a host, you have a pool of resources that all your workflows on it can utilize. And then putting these in a cluster allows for some of the high availability functionality and the mobility. Um, but it's also taking and kind of pooling all those resources into one. Um, so they're a bunch of tightly clustered pools. So the virtual machine can't use resources from um, each host in the pool, but it can jump into another pool if you know, some, something big jumps into the pool and makes a big splash, such as you light up a very large VM, like Exchange or something, right? you may need to move to another pool to make room. And then management, you know, all this technology is great, but you need management to make it work and to use it. You have to look at your resources differently when you virtualize. Like I mentioned before, it's not just the one-to-one -one before from application to hardware. Uh, you've got multiple applications utilizing the same CPUs, same memory, same storage access, uh, back-end disks. Uh, so you have to size your virtual environment correctly. You have to take into account um, that aggregated uh, resource requirement. <coughs> so you do that both by sizing your hosts and your storage and your network correctly, but also by sizing your VMs appropriately. So you, when you move from physical to virtual, or even when you're lighting up a new virtual machine, you need to go through sizing exercises, right? You know, you review the application documentation for what the requirements are. Sometimes those may be too low, but sometimes, but most often it is uh, good to start low with a virtual machine and add more resources as you, as you need them. Um, that's the general best practice. Um, if you're taking an existing environment and trying to virtualize it, you may need to go through and actually do a sizing exercise to determine actual usage based on your organization using various tools that are out there, things like Perfmon and uh, Top that are already built into your operating system, as well as there's third-party tools and uh, manufacturer tools, such as uh, VMware's Capacity Planner. 
which actually uh, looks at all your servers and uh, pulls CPU requirements, memory requirements, disk, you know, et cetera, and it helps you size your environment appropriately. Um, it's always easier to add resources later. Sometimes reclaiming them is harder and often occurs an outage. Uh, CPU. Um, so everything needs to be processed somewhere, so that's what CPUs do. Uh, with respect to sizing virtual machines, it's always best to start your VMs low, and we'll talk a little bit as to why. Um, but uh, um, you also may want to consider scaling your applications out versus up, so have more virtual machines with fewer resources rather than fewer virtual machines with more resources. Again, we'll talk about why. So hyperthreading is a feature that's been around uh, for a long time. Um, in the past, it's been not so great. It's gotten a lot better. It's generally recommended to have it enabled nowadays. But what it does is it takes your cores, your physical cores on your processor. So you have, may have a single socket server with, say, six cores, and you enable hyperthreading. And it'll actually double the logical cores that are displayed to your operating system or to the hypervisor. So on your six core processor, you may see 12 logical cores. So this sounds awesome because you've got now double the cores, right? And it's double performance. No, it's not doubling your performance. The reason this, this is, is hyperthreading, what it does is, uh, well, the way processing works is each core processes what's called a thread, which is an execution from the operating system. Hyperthreading allows each core to execute two threads. So, um, where the where the problem lies in doubling your performance is that you're executing against the same uh, physical compute resources. So you've only got so much compute resource, right? So you can have a thread that takes up 50% of the compute resources, and another thread that uses up 30%. Right, so you've got 100% that you can use. So if you have two threads that need 100% compute, that's not gonna work. So you don't get double, but generally it's about 50, 10 to 15%. You may see more than that, you may see less than that, you may see none at all. Uh, in rare occasions, you may see even negative performance. In the past, that was more common than not, but uh, uh, nowadays it's, it's pretty good. Um, so when you're calculating your uh, core count, you always want to use the physical core count rather than the logical, which is going to be provided by hyperthreading. Um, so again, the reason for that is that uh, you know you got finite com compute resources for each thread, and when you're taking virtual machines, right? You, so you've got your six-core processor, and say you have a virtual machine with six cores. Well, to so schedule all all six virtual CPUs <coughs> on the virtual machine, all six physical cores have to be available for it to be scheduled to. Right? So that's why you actually want fewer uh, vCPUs um, on your virtual machines when you're sizing them, then go bigger. Right? Because if you've got more vCPUs than you have physical cores, your VM may not run, or at least will run poorly. So then uh, uh, non-uniform memory access, or NUMA, it's kind of a uh, pretty deep topic, but uh, uh, what it is is it takes, uh, as, as CPU architectures have grown, as we've added more cores, as we've added more sockets to your servers, uh, uh, more memory bandwidth is required, and the CPUs access the memory banks uh, via what's called a bus, Think of it as a highway, and it only has so many lanes, only has so much bandwidth. So as we've added more cores, more, you know, uh, we need more bandwidth. So what they've done is they've actually taken and created what, call, what are called Newman nodes. So they'll take uh, the memory and divide it across the sockets. And each socket has its own bus to its own set of memory. And its own set of memory is called local memory. Um, Processors can reach the memory on the other node, 
but it's considered remote. And there is a uh, performance impact by reaching out to remote memory. So uh, basically this allows the, uh, having NUMA enabled allows the operating system or the hypervisor to, in, to know which memory is in which node, and therefore uh, where it should store memory based on where that uh, information is going to be processed on the, on the CPUs. So in the BIOS, you'll typically see a node, uh, node interleaving as disabled. That means NUMA is enabled. That's a good thing. Um, this also plays into why you might want to configure virtual machines with fewer vCPUs. Because as your, because your node size is um, typically limited to your socket size, uh, to the cores on your socket. So if you have your six core, or two socket, six core processors, uh, the six cores on one socket is going to be one NUMA node. The other six cores are going to be a different NUMA node. So if you actually have a virtual machine with greater than six vCPUs, you're going to be spanning NUMA nodes, and you're going to be grabbing memory from both your local and remote node, incurring a performance hit. Uh, there are features, uh, VMware has a feature called Virtual NUMA, that allows the guest operating system to actually be aware of the NUMA nodes and uh, properly schedule memory between the two. So if you are spanning your NUMA nodes, that is a function that can uh, improve the performance. But generally you want to size uh, less than the uh, number of processors in your NUMA node. Now it also plays into the memory size. So the memory of your host is actually divided among your sockets and your NUMA nodes. So if you have 32 gigs of RAM and you have NUMA with two sockets, you divide that memory in half, you've got 16 gigs of RAM per NUMA node. So if you have a VM that exceeds 16 gigs of RAM, you're gonna have to go to the other NUMA node, which incurs the performance hit. Um, it's generally rec recommended to enable it because the, the hypervisor will try to schedule local uh, local uh, memory and to the local uh, CPUs. Um, as long as your VMs are sized appropriately, that shouldn't happen. Uh, Intel Turbo Boost is always one that kind of seems to come up. It's not a big factor in virtualization, but what it is is you'll see processors that are advertised at say like a 2.8 gigahertz and then um, Turbo Boost up to like 3.4. Well, what this is, is, is that's actually a uh, dependent on the number of cores that, you, that are active on the processor. So if you've only got one core that's active, the power is actually upped on that core, and that's where you get the 3.4 gigahertz. I kind of overclock it to that. As you start using more cores, it starts using spreading more power around and bringing that clock speed down to ultimately the 2.8. So you don't really see it in a virtual environment, um, but that's what that means. Uh, memory considerations. Again, uh, as it's concerned with the virtual machines, you want to typically start low and increase as needed. A lot of operating systems nowadays will cache information, just lots of information, so a lot of stuff just sits in there inactive, and you could probably be better using um, that information or that uh, memory space elsewhere to get the higher density. Um, Obviously, you want to size your VM appropriately according to your application's actual needs. Sometimes caching is not a bad thing, you know. SQL, Exchange, anything that uh, has a lot of data that wants to quickly access. Uh, your various hypervisors have uh, different memory management techniques. Uh, these first couple, uh, the first two are uh, uh, Microsoft specific, so in Hyper-V. Uh, talk about dynamic memory. This is a uh, Similar to VMware's um, memory ballooning, in that it uh, uses a component within the guest OS to actually request memory and allow the guest operating system to intelligently release it back to the hypervisor. Um, a main difference between uh, VMware's memory ballooning and dynamic memory is that dynamic memory on Hyper-V is configured where you have a, a minimum and a maximum range of memory that can be allocated to the guests. And say you have a VM with eight gigs of RAM, well, 
you wanted to have eight gigs of RAM, but you set up dynamic memory and you set a range of four gigs to eight gigs. When it immediately starts up, VM's gonna request memory, but because the minimum is four gigs, it's gonna be allocated four gigs to begin with. And as it needs more, it's gonna ask for more and be allocated more by the hypervisor. But uh, what it's allocated is what's actually presented to the operating system. It's like if you're looking at your task manager and it's only allocated four gigs, you're only gonna see four gigs. Might be like, well, I'm expecting eight in my virtual machine. That's what I've got set as my maximum. But that's not what you're gonna see until it's actually uh, been allocated. So because of this, because of the way Hyper-V does this, um, they never overcommit memory. So they'll never actually exceed the amount of memory in your host uh, that is allocated to a virtual machine. Um, but uh, some applications do not like dynamic memory because it only presents so, uh, so much memory to the virtual machine. So like SQL, for example, will, when you're installing SQL, if you've only got four gigs of RAM associated with it, it will uh, automatically tune itself to use a percentage of that memory. Whereas if you had, say, 32 as your maximum, and that's what you want it to tune for, it's not going to do that. Um, smart paging is a Hyper-V feature. It was new in uh, version 3, which is server 2012. Um, it's similar to host swapping, but it, um, which is uh, actually where you take memory pages and write it to disk, which is always a bad thing because the disk is the slowest resource that you'll have. Um, but what it does is it uh, will only page uh, when a virtual machine is rebooting. So it, if there's some contention and you know, a virtual machine needs a lot of uh, uh, memory during boot up for some reason, um, it will page only when it's uh, rebooting versus you know pulling from other other virtual machines and paging those to to disk. So it should only impact ones that are not currently serving users. Uh, transparent page sharing is a uh, VMware function um, that uh, will analyze uh, memory pages and look for duplication. So if you've got a lot of uh, virtual machines running the same operating system, you'll see a lot of duplicate memory pages. And what it does is it will uh, take the duplicates and make them into one page, thereby freeing up extra memory. Uh, this has kind of gone away in importance uh, more recently because operating systems start using uh, what's called large memory pages, which are either two or four megs, I forget which, uh, whereas the small memory pages are 4K, so quite a difference. Um, and the reason that they don't use uh, transparent page sharing on the larger memory, uh, memory pages is because of uh, the compute power that it would take to process all of that. Um, so pretty much you don't see a huge impact from uh, transparent page sharing on your memory consolidation. Um, and actually, due to a security vulnerability found in this function uh, in VMware, they've actually decided to disable it going forward in patches starting in December. <coughs> um, it's not, it shouldn't be a huge risk. Uh, VMware's press release stated that uh, they don't see it as a huge risk because it takes very, very specific circumstances to perform um, where they could basically see, or a hacker could potentially see memory from another virtual machine in the environment. Um, but it takes very specific um, circumstances to perform and would likely not happen in a production environment. But their stance is secure out of the box, so that they're turning that off, which probably won't affect your environment, but if you're uh, relying heavily on uh, memory overcommitment, it may. Uh, memory ballooning, like I said, is, uh, uses a component inside the guest operating system to request memory back from the operating system, back so it can be given back to the hypervisor. Uh, this only actually kicks in at 96% memory usage on the host. So um, once you reach that point, you're getting, you're definitely in the danger zone. You don't want to be that high. Um, granted, if you have a very large host with lots of memory, so I mean, even at you know 4% at 128 gigs of memory on your host, that's still about five gigs. 
got a little, little wiggle room to play with. Uh, memory compression, something that was introduced in uh, ESXi 4.1. And uh, what it is is similar to page sharing, except that it's actually compressing versus uh, deduplicating. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, CPU overhead on the host to perform this, but it happens under memory contention. So basically, mm -hmm. you've run out of memory, and it's trying its best to gain a little bit back. So, so that it doesn't have to do this last thing, which is host swapping, right, where we write our memory pages to disk, and that's, that's really bad. <laughs> so uh, you know, to recap, uh, compression swapping and smart paging indicate that there is actual host contention at the time. Uh, ballooning is a warning sign, and it means you're pretty close. Storage. Storage is kind of a big topic in itself, it's both an art and a science. Um, and it's important when you're you know, designing your applications, designing your uh, VMs and your uh, infrastructure, that you understand the storage characteristics of your application and of your store backend storage. So your applications may, be, uh, may have a lot of reads and writes, and there is a difference between in the performance aspects of reads versus writes. Uh, they may be random, or they may be sequential, where they do a bunch of very long reads or writes. Um, it all depends on your application. Uh, and you also want to size uh, perform uh, capacity versus performance. And, you know, in a typical environment, we'll throw capacity at it, uh, which just means adding more drives, which typically delivers better performance. Well, most people didn't take into consideration performance unless they had a big application like SQL or Exchange, uh, something that's very important to their organization, and they know needs performance, but they don't really understand the back-end storage all the time. Uh, so they'll throw a capacity at it, and they get the performance, but when you do it in a virtual environment, you can't just throw a capacity at it because you're going to have a lot of different workloads with a lot of different characteristics all trying to access the same set of spindles versus one application accessing a bunch of spindles. Um, more spindles equals more performance, and when I say spindles, I just mean regular hard drives, right? spinning disks. Um, RAID type is important, and what RAID is is a redundancy mechanism for taking a well, it's a mechanism for taking multiple disks and making them together and redundant and improve performance uh, versus just having a single disk. Uh, there's various RAID types. There's uh, most common are RAID 1, mm -hmm. RAID 5, RAID 6, and RAID 10. RAID 1 is what's called mirroring. You have two drives and they just copy each other. Right? And the thing about RAID 1 is it's, it's pretty fast for reads because um, you actually get a read from both disks. Writes have to go to both both disks as well, but it's the same data, whereas reads can be different data. So you get a little bit better uh, reads, but your write per penalty is actually half half the potential uh, IOs that the disks are able to deliver. So when you use RAID, you're combining the IOs of all the disks. With RAID 1, you're actually having it, so you only get the IOs of 1. RAID 5 actually takes and uh, spreads it across three or more disks and uses one of the disks as a parity disk. It's basically, one of the disks is one of a, as a parity disk. And what that means is you can lose a disk and it can still rebuild the information um, with the other two disks. Now, you know, writes are, or reads are really good because you're pulling across three or more disks. Writes, however, have to be written across all the disks as well as a parity. So you're actually, uh, you take your available IOPS, which is your <coughs> IOPS per second, and divide it by four. So you're actually losing a lot of write IOPS in a RAID 5. So it's better for reads, not so good for writes. So if you have an application that's very write intensive, you may not want to use RAID 5, or you may need to add a lot more spindles to achieve the apps that you need. RAID 6 is basically RAID 5, except that there's two parity drives, so you could lose two drives and still maintain, um, still continue running. However, there's also the same write performance hit there. RAID 10 is just RAID 1 across multiple drives. Essentially, you have 
um, what's called RAID 0, which is just striping, where you take a bunch of drives, write the data across it, there's no redundancy, you lose one, it's gone. Well, RAID 10 is RAID 0 plus 1, essentially, where you stripe across a bunch of drives, and then you mirror it across a bunch of other drives. So you're actually losing half your capacity by having double the drives, but you've got both really good redundancy as well as good performance because your, your reads, you're able to read from all these different drives, you know, either one, you know, either the main one or the mirrored one, but you're also able to write across all these drives and it just has to be written to each pair of drives. So you're only, again, back at half your IOPS. Uh, so again, very important to consider these. Uh, RAID 5 may be fine for most virtual environments. RAID 10 is often a recommendation, but it's very expensive because you're losing half your capacity. Um, other considerations in your storage environment might be like deduplication. This is a SAN side feature which will take a look at your data, look for duplicate bits and try and consolidate them. Um, this is both good and bad. So if you're from a performance perspective, if you're taking data, you know, if you've sized it for both performance and capacity, and then you turn on deduplication, and all of a sudden you have all this extra space, and you start putting more stuff on there, more workload, more IOPS, you're, you've reduced your capacity requirement. Well, you've increased your capacity available, but you haven't increased your performance available. So you're putting more more uh, IOPS requirements on your same storage backend, and therefore you could run into uh, storage contention. There's things like flash drives, which are basically like a thumb drive, uh, just in a hard drive format. Um, they're very, very fast. They don't come with huge uh, capacities, and they're fairly expensive. Prices are coming down, and capacities are getting bigger, but still kind of at that point where you can't use it for everything, right? So you use it in very strategic locations, such as uh, your very uh, high performance storage, not capacity storage, but performance storage. And you can even use it in other functions where all the writes hit flash storage, and then as the SAN is less busy, it writes it down to your slower storage, um, kind of negating some of that write performance hit that we talked about in the RAID sets. Um, or even using tiered storage, where the top tier, the busiest data, gets moved up into these flash drives, so they're super fast, and then when it's cold data, and it's not as uh, active, it actually gets moved down into either your main storage array, or even down into lower cost storage, like your SATA drives. Um, there's a lot of different connectivity options out there. Uh, fiber channel, which is a uh, kind of a dedicated storage medium. Um, and then there's a fiber channel over Ethernet, which takes uh, your Ethernet network, you know, typically 10 gig, um, and will run the fiber channel protocol over an Ethernet connection. Then there's actually iSCSI and NFS, which are both uh, IP-based. They're actually using your data network as the uh, communication path. So things like QoS and uh, what not come into play there, but you've got a lot of different connectivities which you know if, uh, Things like fiber channel and fiber channel or Ethernet can you know require a lot more They have better performance, but they require more infrastructure more expensive infrastructure whereas iSCSI and NFS You know rely on the data network, which is not a lossless Technology right so there's a possibility for packet loss um, Which could impact your storage performance but it's a lot cheaper because it uses your existing infrastructure. Uh, then another consideration when you're doing these IP is uh, 10 gig versus uh, 1 gig. You know, if you don't have 10 gig today, it might be expensive to do so. So you can leverage more 1 gig interfaces to scale out your storage. Uh, more storage. Um, again, start low on the uh, disk size. Increase as needed. Um, Storage is the big place where it's easier to add more than it is to get it back. It's often more difficult to reclaim that storage. Um, and, you know, I'll see a lot of people will um, allocate a whole bunch of storage because that's what they think they need. That's what they've been told that it might use. So that's what they allocate right up front. And then, uh, you know, 
a year later they're still only using 30 40 percent of it you know they could have been using that extra you know say it's 500 gigs that they've just extra allocated out there that they could have been using elsewhere uh, so this thick and thin provisioning what thick provisioning is is uh, taking the actual drive and allocating all the storage immediately um, that way your back-end storage actually knows that it's been used. Nothing else can take that space that may have already been, uh, yeah, nothing else can take the space because it's already allocated. Um, versus thin will grow as you need it. You allocate 500 gigs, but only as it's written within the virtual machine will it be allocated on the actual storage. So you have the potential for oversubscribing your storage in that case where you've allocated more storage than is actually available, but you're not actually using that much. There's a small performance hit within provision, um, usually negligible, but if you're having a either an IO heavy or a, a very large capacity drive, it's best to thick provision it that way so you don't incur the performance hit and you, uh, um, you've allocated all that space so that you don't run into a uh, oversubscription issue. And then thin is usually best for small capacity drives or operating systems. Uh, RDMs or raw device mappings are a, a VMware feature that uh, will often come up. Um, in the past, it's been very big on, you know, people will bring it up for performance reasons. Eh, studies have shown it's actually not, uh, not that much faster, so performance is negligible, not a reason to use it. Better to use uh, the traditional storage, the MDKs. Uh, reasons to use them is anything over, uh, drive size is over two terabytes. If you need that to a virtual machine, uh, use an RDM. Uh, in the latest version of VMware, um, they do support 62 terabyte uh, VMDKs. There are some caveats with that though, so if you want to use that, read your documentation. Uh, SAN-based snapshots, so we're using uh, your SAN to take a snapshot of the uh, data and use it as kind of a backup. Um, you want to use uh, RDMs. And then also like Microsoft clustering, so for SQL or other applications, um, does require an RDM. Unified communications. So again, this is the voice and video, you know, real-time media applications. Uh, talk about, okay. Um, you see it as an application, right? Just think of it as an application when you come to virtualizing it. But like other applications, it has strict requirements, right? Real-time media doesn't like latency. You know, virtualization has the ability to add latency. Um, from a UC perspective, Avaya and Cisco only support VMware. Um, they do not support, in um, Microsoft, Avaya, and Cisco do not support memory or CPU oversubscription. So that is to say, uh, your virtual machine vCPUs cannot exceed your uh, physical CPUs. Same with memory allocation, cannot exceed that. Um, thin or dynamic disks are not supported, right? So you may potentially have to allocate several hundred gigs to your UC environment right off the bat. Uh, reservations on CPU and memory, so making sure that the host always has it available, are recommended, but it's not a replacement for a one-to-one, -to -one, the one-to-one -one requirement. Um, CPU speeds may vary on the different application requirements. It's always good to add overhead, add, add some additional extra. Like Avaya, for example, released a document that says um, the recommended CPU is 2.4 gigahertz processors. Um, but to run at peak capacity, they required a, a 2.9 year processor. So always add a little extra headroom, it'll be beneficial. Um, UC, or, uh, Cisco UC supports uh, ESXi 4.1 or greater. Um, they have what's called trusted reference configs, uh, which are pre spec hardware models uh, for both their rack mount and chassis based um, UCS series servers. Um, so they're spec'd to the applications that are going to be running on it. Uh, most of our applications do support vMotion and storage vMotion as the ability to move from one host to another or one data store to another with 
12 that you'd be in this live. However, uh, it's typically not recommended during production hours. And the dynamic, the uh, automated functionality of that, the DRS, you know, dynamic resource scheduler, uh, is not supported. So only manual emotions are supported. Uh, dynamic power management is not supported. Uh, typically snapshots are not supported. And snapshots in general, uh, people sometimes use them as a backup. They're not really a backup. <laughs> um, they, they are used for a quick rollback in very specific applications. So if you have an application that's all within itself and doesn't reach out into things like Active Directory or Backend SQL Database, um, they're good for that um, because the snapshot only holds what's inside of it. Um, so when you roll back, you may be out of sync with whatever's been done outside of the partition. So use your use your backup applications instead of snapshots. Uh, use, uh, Cisco does have restrictions around non-UC, which are Cisco applications that are non-real-time media, such as a prime infrastructure, um, and third-party VMs, which is going to be everything else. So they do have require uh, rules around co-resing those VMs on the same host as the UC VMs. Um, there's a, a link to the uh, uh, their virtualization wiki and the additional uh, uh, resources on the PowerPoint slide that's on the thumb drives. So that'll that'll contain all the rules for what applications can or cannot co-res. Uh, Microsoft supports uh, both VMware and Hyper-V, surprisingly. Yeah. Um, they do recommend 2012 or R2 or greater. Um, you know, 2008 R2 is supported but not recommended. Uh, dynamic memory is not supported, so one of those applications that they don't support it on. And when I'm talking about Microsoft UC, I'm talking about Link or Skype for Business. This has recently been renamed. Um, live migration vMotion, not supported. <laughs> um, Hyper-threading must be disabled according to their virtualization white paper. Within VMware, there's actually a uh, ability to turn it off on a per VM basis, turn off hyper-threading. So you can do that. Uh, Numa spanning should be disabled. And Numa spanning is a Hyper-V setting that actually disables um, and forces that a virtual machine be, uh, uh, the memory be sent to a local node. So it's <coughs> different than the uh, BIOS setting that we talked about. Avaya actually supports uh, ESXi 5.0 and greater. Um, they do support vMotion. Um, not recommended during peak hours, but they do uh, support it during you know, production hours. Uh, they are recommending uh, DRS and HA, uh, as long as you have conservative thresholds. Uh, snapshots are supported, um, but they recommend no longer than 24 to 72 hours. Part of that is uh, because there is a performance hit when snapshots are on active on a VM, um, as well as the performance hit and potential downtime um, when you actually commit that differential part of the snapshot back into the base file. Uh, Levi also supports uh, flexible hardware footprints, which means um, when you deploy the OVA that contains the application, uh, they allow you to actually change the hardware depending on your uh, number of users. Uh, whereas Cisco, they have an OVA for your number of users and they do not allow you to change it. It's not supported. Uh, some differences between VMware and Hyper-V. Um, in Hyper-V, the hypervisor is free, right? so you can run it by itself. Um, you can utilize a lot of the functions without paying for the hypervisor license. Um, however, um, you have to do you do have to pay for a management license for them to use their native uh, management application, which you also have to pay for. Uh, to be able to, for that to be able to manage it. Uh, Windows Server licenses are always separate, whether it's be VMware or Microsoft. So if you're running Hyper-V, you still have to pay for Windows licenses. Um, ESXi does require um, vCenter, which is its native ma management application, for advanced features such as vMotion and hyper, uh, high availability, whereas Hyper-V does not. You just have to use multiple tools to do it instead of a single pane of glass or its uh, native uh, management tool, VMM. Um, 
we're running out of time, so I'm just going to skip through this. Uh, some quick management applications. Uh, Hyper-V, you know, System Center, uh, SolarWinds, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, and then another company called Veeam uh, offers a, both a good backup solution as well as a management solution that works for both VMware and Hyper-V. Um, VMware, of course, has their native um, tools as well as a System Center, Microsoft System Center can also manage ESXi hosts as well as Hyper-V hosts. And of course there's SolarWinds and Beam in there. And yeah. So these additional resources, there's link to those in the notes on the uh, drive, on the slides. Yeah, all right, thank you, that's it. Hey Andy, I <laughs> just had a question for you, there might be others, but with, uh, we talked about uh, going slow or, or low resource-wise when you start out and then adding in the, the future. You know, for the UC applications we're talking about from Microsoft or Avaya or Cisco, we can buy that and we've got uh, recommendations from the manufacturer in terms mm -hmm. of processor and memory and, and the like. Are, are you saying don't don't follow those, go in lower and, and then add? Or uh, in say? that case, they do not support it. Um, so as I mentioned, the OVAs cannot be uh, modified in a uh, Cisco environment, but Avaya does support the flexible footprint as long as you follow the documentation. Um, Microsoft doesn't use OVAs, so you create your virtual machines and then size it appropriately. Uh, they would also, there, there is a little leeway in that situation. Um, they would say go with the recommendations, but those recommendations are around very large pools, like 80,000 users or so. So most environments are not that big. <laughs> so there's a little flexibility. So, so the difference there, when you're talking about start small and go go larger, you're talking about the difference between designing a VMware environment and using it for a UC application. When you use it for a UC application, you need to go with the resources that the vendor or the manufacturer is telling you to use. But when you're designing your VMware environment, you need to start smaller uh, and grow because it's hard to retain. Yeah, when you're building out your applications, um, you do need to refer to manufacturer documentation. That's always a given. You know. Uh, I say start small because if there is flexibility in the requirements, start smaller, build as you need it. Um, other require other applications will have requirements, you know, very strict requirements. You have to meet this. You see, is one of those. So you need to follow the documentation and size it according to that. But not all applications are saying you, know, you have to have eight CPUs and thirty gigs of RAM. Um, you, know, you can start a little bit smaller for your environment. Because yeah, we have a lot of environments where they'll they'll build it and then uh, to the manufacturer documentation and then they'll tune it down later because hey it's still running uh, with the features and services that I want but then all of a sudden they'll come up with a problem and they'll want to open a ticket with that manufacturer and that manufacturer will basically say well I'm sorry you're not meeting the hardware requirements in your in your VMs do that and then we'll talk to you so there's a delay sometimes when you're troubleshooting. Um, it, with those environments, if you've tuned them down so that you don't have as much contention. So right. just be aware of that as well. Any other questions? You've mentioned several times about taking snapshots. Mm -hmm. um, in storage arrays these days, there's snapshot components that are built into the array level versus at the OS or even hyper level. How does that affect? Um, snapshots at the array level are different from snapshots within the hypervisor. Um, in the hypervisor, they create what's called a differential file which is where all the changes are written to, so the base file is actually just, it's not touched. Uh, in VMware, there's actually a, uh, they handle the differential files differently, so there is actually a performance hit. And also when you uh, commit a snapshot at the hypervisor level, there is a um, lot of write activity when it takes all that differential information and has to write it into the base file. Uh, whereas snapshots at a SAN level, uh, there is I.O. hits, um, because you're already using this, but as long as they're on a separate line, fine. Um, but when you're, you know, even when you're reverting to a snapshot, it's uh, not having to write that data over. So there isn't, there isn't as much impact, and those are actually preferred. Is there any chance that Cisco's willing to support Hyper-V on their UC platforms as opposed to just uh, VMware? Um, at this time, we have no information that they will. 
I don't see it as likely. Um, part of that is because uh, it's a lot of work to uh, vet out these solutions in a virtualized environment. So they'll probably try and uh, keep it to one hypervisor. That's why Avi has done it that way. I'm sure that's why Cisco's done it that way. And because VMware is, uh, uh, it's been around a lot longer, um, probably more mature. I just don't see it happening anytime soon. You guys want to take a break? Yeah, I'll be hanging around if anyone else has any questions.